Good morning. Yeah, it's uh, hard to believe for me uh, that uh, we've already reached uh, the time of year that we call Christmas. Uh, it seems like uh, this has been a long year. Uh, in fact, I've had conversation a couple of times already this morning with people who said that they can hardly wait for the next year to be here. And uh, I think that that's probably a, a, common, a common perspective, uh, especially considering what this year has uh, held for us, uh, some of the things that uh, we've endured and that we continue to endure. And I know that I'm looking forward to a uh, time of peace. I'm looking forward to uh, maybe, uh, maybe some uh, different things that uh, are held this year. And uh, so uh, we, will, we will watch as this year unfolds and uh, uh, we'll, we'll do so, I'm sure, with uh, bated breath. Um, come on, guys. Uh, I, I uh, don't normally notice them back there signaling me to turn my microphone on, but I happen to notice this year, so or this year, today. Yeah, I was talking about years. Uh, we're going to continue, and uh, this will be the last uh, in uh, the series of sermons that we started uh, three weeks ago, which is uh, Unto Us. And uh, our takeoff uh, has been from a passage of scripture in Isaiah, uh, which was written probably 700 years, uh, between seven and 800 years uh, before the birth of Jesus Christ. So it was foretold that uh, unto Israel was going to be uh, a hope, that there was going to be a new day, or as we would say, there's going to be a new year. And uh, the story that we're looking at this morning is uh, an old story. It's one that many people look forward to for a variety of reasons. Uh, but I think uh, that within us uh, really lies, I, I, I believe, uh, a hope that uh, is inherent to the human heart. And uh, that is, is that at some point uh, there will be some peace. And, you know, I was looking back uh, over uh, just uh, some statistics. And uh, it's interesting that in uh, recorded human history, uh, which uh, really as far as uh, accurate uh, portrayal of history... Uh, probably three to four thousand years. I believe the earth has been here a little bit longer than that. I think we're, uh, we're about into our 6,000th year uh, by biblical calculations. But uh, around three to four thousand years of recorded history, uh, as far as uh, secular history is concerned, uh, we know that we've only experienced about 8% of that time as years of peace. Uh, I think that by a couple of historians' calculations, it winds up being 268 years of peace in like 3,414 years. That's not a, a great record. And what I would say in that is that for all of our hopes and for all of our desires, we have not been very successful as a species, if you want to refer to humanity that way, uh, in ushering in the thing that uh, for the most part I, I believe that we desire the most. We just want to have peace. We want to have rest uh, in life. And this morning we're going to be looking at one of the four titles that we started off with uh, that is referring to Jesus Christ in the prophecy in Isaiah, and uh, that is the Prince of Peace. And I think there's probably no title that we could ascribe to God, uh, no attribute or no characteristic of God that is more needed at the time that we live in. In Isaiah 9 6, this verse reveals four names for Christ. Each one unlocks a different aspect of his character. And as I say, peace, uh, this title that we see here, the Prince of Peace, is one that we have a desperate need for today. Our text says that a child will be born to us. And Isaiah was speaking to the nation of Israel. He said, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Exter uh, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. And we have in this passage of scripture, as I said, a summation of titles for Christ. But it's more than just a summation of names that we would call him in this prophecy, which reveals to us both his divine nature and his human nature. It's more than just titles. It's more than just names. It actually describes an attribute for him. It describes characteristics uh, of his very nature. And I think that's an important one. You know, when we look throughout the scripture, a lot of times... Uh, when we think of peace, and especially when we think of this title, Prince of Peace, it winds up being a punctuation point, maybe an exclamation mark in biblical text. But this morning I want to take you, uh, after reading our text and looking at this name, 
of, uh, of Prince of Peace, I want to take you to a passage of Scripture uh, in the New Testament and explore this just a little bit further. And the reason why I want to go to this passage in Ephesians this morning is because this passage of Scripture really is saturated with the concepts of peace. And I know that as I look at Scripture that there are several things that I need to understand about peace. Not just that peace is wrapped up in the person of Christ. Not just that peace is desirable. Not just that I'm supposed to be a peacemaker as one of God's children. Not just that we're supposed to be a people of peace. Not just that there's a process for peace or a path for peace. Not just that I need to seek peace. Uh, All of these things, yes, they are important. But uh, I know that as I examine my own life, uh, I want peace to be an inherent part of who I am. In this passage of scripture in Ephesians, Jesus is not referred to as Prince of Peace, but we do find in this passage that is saturated with the concept of peace some very important things for us, <coughs> excuse me, as believers. Uh, what are we going to find? Well, I think that what we're going to find is, is that the importance of this is there uh, because the concepts of peace uh, are uh, really sprinkled in this world with misperceptions or misconceptions about peace also. I want to read this passage of scripture to you and spend some time and show you uh, that that uh, does not usually portend good things with our microphone the last couple of weeks here. Uh, so I'm, in, I'm anticipating here. Uh, but, but this particular passage of scripture, I want to spend some time looking at uh, the very practical aspects Uh, of uh, Christian living that are contained within it, along with the theological significance of it. Uh, uh, Ephesians is a deeply, uh, a deep theological book, and it also contains in it some very deep theological truths with regard to ecclesiology, or what God's purpose is in his redeemed people. And uh, that's an important part of it, but uh, I want to show you that it contains even much more than that. I'm going to read through our text in its entirety with you for just a moment here, and then we'll move on and spend some time looking at its context uh, and also its implication and application for us today. The Apostle Paul was writing here to the church at Ephesus. Uh, We just spent some time in Revelation. This is one of the churches that was mentioned of the seven churches in Asia, and he wrote to them. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinance, so that in himself he might make the two into one, uh, one new man, thus establishing peace. And he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. And you know this particular passage of scripture, it's, it's an interesting one. And I think that as we go into and explore the significance of it and try to make application of it, and how the Prince of Peace has dealt with us, what we can learn from this aspect of the character of Jesus Christ. Not just his character, though, but his very purpose and mission as he came to this earth. The scripture tells us that a son would be given unto us, a child would be born unto us. So what is his purpose? Why were we given this child? Why was this uh, God-man born unto us? This scripture is going to, I think, enlighten us and help us understand a little bit more about that. You know, as you explore the significance of this, it's, I think it's of great value uh, to look and to try to understand the cultural context, uh, the time that this was being written, and uh, it would have been written to probably a group of Jews uh, and Gentiles who were mixed uh, in the congregation there at the church at Ephesus, and this writing that Paul uh, gave to them, uh, there were some significant things there, some, some things that we would, it would escape our understanding uh, without, under, without maybe giving some attention uh, to that particular time and some of the things that were a part of the experience that Paul had uh, and maybe that the Gentiles and the Jews had at that point in time. There is in this passage a uh, reference to something, I believe, uh, that uh, maybe you've uh, heard about, maybe you've uh, seen, but I want to revisit it if that's the case. 
Uh, there is a, uh, a picture that I have up here. It's, uh, it's a picture of the Temple Mount, uh, of, the, of the compound or the temple area there in Jerusalem. And uh, this is a representation of, of Herod's temple, uh, which uh, actually was destroyed in AD 70. Uh, but at the time of its construction, it was one of the largest religious edifices uh, in the known world. And uh, this particular court that we're referencing here, the Court of Gentiles, was a place that was set aside uh, that those who were from other nations, not Jews, not uh, people from Israel, but those from other nations, could come to the temple and worship. But they were not allowed to, to go beyond the barriers that were erected uh, in, this, uh, in this particular uh, portion of the Temple Mount. Uh, there was a wall there that was called Sereg, and it was a wall that was uh, about 1.3 meters or uh, around 4 foot tall, and it was punctuated with, uh, with some columns, uh, and there were 13 signs that were placed uh, in the openings, 13 openings and 13 signs, uh, the historian Josephus tells us, uh, that uh, warned Gentiles that they were not supposed to go beyond this court. That it, because they were not Jewish, they could not approach the temple. And this was serious business. It's not like the signs we have back, back there that say, uh, do, not, uh, do not proceed back here. Uh, and uh, you see us opening the door and going, uh, you know, time after time, people going back there. Uh, it, it's really just kind of a general announcement. It just is that that's not really an open part of our building that we sanitize on a weekly basis while we're in this, uh, you know, pandemic. So everybody sort of understands that. Uh, there's no threat of death, but it was a little bit different in the, in the Temple Mound. Uh, in that particular instance, in 1871, there was a, uh, uh, actually a, a stone uncovered, and this was the first one written in Greek. And uh, this sign that was uh, a, a stone that was engraved uh, was one of uh, those signs that uh, was laid out in the court of the Gentiles that precluded them from going forth. And they were in both Greek and Latin, which would have been uh, the language of Rome at the time. Uh, this is a picture of the stone that, uh, that you would see, and on this stone is some writing, uh, and it says, No foreigners to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death which will follow. And uh, that's a pretty ominous warning, isn't it? Uh, and so this was a prominent feature uh, in the temple. And uh, if you were to take this, and uh, just, uh, just, you know, kind of extract it from uh, what people would have understood, especially the Jewish people and the Apostle Paul who was writing this, I think it lends itself to a little bit of a, uh, more of an understanding of, of how the readers would have been impacted by what Paul wrote. And as we look at this, uh, I believe that uh, it's important that we examine and sort of break down what is revealed in our text about, uh, about peace and uh, this, this uh, you know, a little background that I've given you plays into that. One of the things that we find out as we examine, as we examine our text is that uh, peace on earth uh, was not just a gift from God that got passed out like Christmas cookies. We find out that the peace on earth was actually a person that came. And, you know, we talk about that, Emmanuel, God with us. And we talk about a baby being born. We talk about a son being given unto us. And there's a lot of misconceptions in the world today about what peace is. And I think that sometimes, even in our faith, that uh, we, are, we are prone to asking God to give us something uh, that really shouldn't be treated in the same way that we would treat maybe Christmas cookies that get handed out. Uh, the peace of God is not something that you can separate, it, separate from the God of peace. In fact, uh, you know, as we examine scripture, we find out that these things are tied together. We find out that peace is actually a person. And that as people are seeking peace, as they're trying to find, you know, this elusive thing that mankind has only spent 8% of his recorded history experiencing, they are many times trying to bypass trying to bypass the requirement that peace comes through a person. That peace is not just something that God just hands out to you and says, here, take one of these with you as you go because you're going to need this. It's something that comes through him. It's something that is in him. As we look at our text for a moment, it says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been 
brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. That peace is wrapped up in a person. Peace is personified. And, you know, this world that we live in, uh, they would like to have the peace of God for sure. But they don't always want the, the God of peace. And I was having a discussion with someone. We've had the opportunity because of, I think, the great need in our community at this time to pass out food uh, to, uh, to people who uh, come through. In fact, uh, in the past couple of weeks, and it varies by week, we've had around 120 families that we've ministered to that have passed through this. And that is an awesome work. But I was having a discussion this morning with someone, and we were talking a little bit about the imperative that we don't forget that even though it is a good thing to extend kindness to people, we must not forget that it is Christ who we want them to have, not just a full belly. The peace of a full belly will go away in a few hours, but the peace of God will not. When it comes through Jesus Christ, it's for a lifetime. In fact, it's for eternity. Uh, one of the things that we have to remember as a church is, is that while we cannot afford to allow the tail to wag the dog, we must not forget that the dog does have a tail, and there's a function there. How would you know the dog was friendly unless his tail was wagging, right? So anyway, as we examine this, it's important that we remember that our mission, that our purpose is the person of Jesus Christ, that the peace that is offered only comes through him. You know, as you examine scripture, you find this even in the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. In verse 11, it says, For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. God himself came, both the Son uh, and uh, a gift from God for us, a child. Verse 14 says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And people are enamored at this time of year with peace on earth, goodwill toward men. But not always do they want the God of peace that has to come with the peace of God. You can't just hand the peace of God out like it's a commodity. It has to come by a person taking Christ in their heart. And this is an absolute necessity for us to remember. One of the things that we learn about peace is that peace is personified or is a person. We also find out in scripture that peace has a price. I think most of us understand that. But we get to a point and we think that the price is uh, sort of behind us and uh, maybe the price is compromise, but the reality for us is more so than that. The price for peace must be paid. And there is no such thing as peace without a price. And sometimes we look at that and we think that that's just a matter of compromise. But when we begin to think about this in a spiritual sense, we know that we stand at enmity with God, that we are enemies with God, and that the only way that that peace can be made Switch over for your benefit and mine. All right. Uh, so this piece, as I mentioned, this piece has a price. Uh, and as I mentioned, also there is no such thing as peace without a price. There's a cost to be paid. In fact, our text says that it says, "But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ." And so this process, if you will, of bringing peace. Uh, is something that has been done at the expense of God. Not only was he the offended one, not only was he the one that was distanced by our sin, we are the offenders, he is the offended one, but he paid the price to make that peace happen. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, there are a lot of times when uh, I think I want peace, but I'm not always willing to pay the price. I know that there are some times in... You know, it just kind of works this way where uh, it's, I don't know if it's a guy thing or not, where I sort of evaluate and I say, is it, is it worth it for me to say that, you know? And, uh, and then sometimes I, I just think, yep, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and pay the price for that. It's worth it. The satisfaction of saying that is going to be worth the price that I pay. We, we recognize that there is a price. Uh, there's a price when we start conflict, but there is also a price for peace. We know that Jesus paid that price for peace. It was a high price. There was enmity that stood between us and God. But the scripture tells us that those who were far off were brought near by the blood of Christ. It's interesting to me as I shared with you the, the context 
the cultural context and perhaps what those who were listening to this and the Apostle Paul as he wrote uh, would have been relating to. And, you know, especially as we delve a little bit further into this passage, we find that, uh, that, that there is a, a picture of our ecclesiology, if you will, uh, that speaks of, of putting the Gentiles and the Jews into one body. That it's God's intention that this symbol of his love and of his people, this local assembly that he desires to put together, that it would be constituted by people who were far off or Gentiles and people who were Jews. And this may not seem like such a big deal to us, but if you were to consider temple worship and what we had just got through talking about, there were people who were far off, Gentiles. They could not approach but up to a certain point. They just weren't allowed to on the pain of death. And the picture that is given in this is really an a invaluable one uh, to convey the idea of how God feels and what He wants us to understand about peace. Another thing that we can glean from the Scripture, not only is peace uh, wrapped up in a person or is peace being personified, not only does it have its own price, but peace also has a provocation. And I find that real peace actually comes as a result of desire for oneness, not weariness of conflict. Many times as we approach peace, we're just tired of the conflict. I can't even tell you how many times that I have uh, been an, an intermediary or mediated between people that were in conflict, and I can see the weariness on them. They're just tired of conflict. And many times in, in marriage counseling, uh, that, that is a phrase which I hear often. I hear, I hear this often. I just want peace. I just want peace. But what we have to understand is that the peace that Scripture is talking about there uh, is not one that is provoked uh, through weariness of conflict. It is provoked by a desire for oneness. And there is a huge difference there. Because you see, a, a peace that is provoked by weariness of conflict says things like, well, let's just agree to disagree, and then we'll just go our separate way. Oh, we'll still be friends, uh, but we'll probably never talk to each other again. You know, this is the kind of peace that is provoked by a weariness of conflict. But a peace that is provoked by a desire for oneness is much, much different. So is it oneness or weariness that is the provocation. As you look at the scripture in our text, he says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near. And what you have to understand is that Jesus, as he approached bringing peace, the Prince of Peace, that it was his desire to bring those who were far off and bring them to a place of nearness, from farness to nearness. And you read a little bit further, and it says, you, This is done by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, and he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. That his desire was oneness, that there was unity that was the provocation behind this. God didn't just want to set things straight or agree to disagree and then go his separate way. That is a type of peace that is something that uh, is, is undergirded by the misconceptions of this world. The peace that God was looking for was reconciliation. It was a oneness. And you know, many times in the world that we live in, uh, we, we have to wind up being satisfied with a peace that is provoked by just a desire for the end of conflict. And that's just kind of where we're at, how we get there, and you know, what we do. Is it a bad thing? Well, I don't know that it's always a bad thing to get tired of fighting, but in one sense, it is a bad thing. If I just want relief, it's just like I resign myself to a level of, of anxiety and tension within that relationship, which isn't healthy. But when I have a desire for oneness, it looks very, very different. Very, very different. I move from doing what I have to do to satisfy the demands of the opposite party to in, into a place where I have a desire to please the other person. And if you've been in a relationship with people, you know very well what it looks like, the difference between those two. The relationship that is built upon the desire to please one another is completely satisfying. Whereas the relationship that says, I'll do enough to keep them off my back, that kind of relationship is not satisfying to either person. It just brings tension. It's not real peace. 
And this is what we find in Scripture, the desire that Christ had to bring those who were far off to be near, to, to make out of two one. This is what he desired, both groups into one. And he did this by breaking down the barrier. And this really kind of brings us to our next point about peace. And that is, is that peace has a path. That there is a way to establish peace. This is a part of the very practical teaching of this passage of Scripture. And something that as people of peace, we need to understand. This should be how we live. This should be who we are. This is something I believe that winds up being the application for us in this we find out that peace has a path for sure. Real peace requires that the source of conflict is identified and dealt with. And that's exactly what God did. He didn't come to the table and uh, try to maneuver and bargain. He didn't come to the table and uh, try to get as much as he could. He identified the real source of conflict and he wanted to have that dealt with. And I think this is an important part the real peace process. It requires transparency. God is completely transparent in the way he deals with us, but it requires us to get to a place where we're willing to be gut honest with God. I haven't been willing, we might say, to get really down to business with God and just tell him that, you know, this is who I am. This is what I've done. This is my life. Please forgive me. You know, that gut honesty is such an important part of the path for peace. Scripture tells us in our text, he says, which is the law of commandment contained in ordinance, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. What you see in this, in the establishment of peace, is that there was a process engaged in. I want to talk about that a little bit more. Our text says that he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. In this passage of scripture, what you find out is, is that what God really intended to reveal sin was very effective at revealing sin. But the law was never intended to create peace. The law, in fact, was about judgment and condemnation. And you will find as a source of conflict that there is always judgment and condemnation that there are always unmet desires. That's what it tells us in the book of James. And as we kind of try to push all of these things together and wrap our mind around it, what we find is, is that the only way that real peace can be found is if the condemnation and the judgment that is an inherent part uh, of conflict, if that cannot be dealt with, then real peace will not be found. Jesus dealt with it. The way that he dealt with it is, is that he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. He abolished in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments. What he did was fulfill the law. The law revealed the fact that we, we stood separated from God. We couldn't keep the law. We couldn't meet his demands. We stood at odds with him. And, you know, as, as Paul talked about this, it was a stark picture, if you will, uh, you know, not only in the law and its purpose, but even the ordinance of man, which this whole court of the Gentile thing was a Jewish addition to the law of God. It wasn't required. It, it was something that was put in there, uh, at, you know, really under the direction of rabbinical law, which was an addition to Scripture. But it wound up dividing Jesus came and one of the things that he did is he separated, or excuse me, he eliminated the separation, not only of Jew from Gentile and calling uh, for the breaking down of that wall, uh, but he, he came to save all men, the scripture tells us, but also in, in parting the veil in the temple that separated man from God. And these things become very apparent. He identified this. And you know, you will find out, and this is key, in understanding the way that the process of peace works, this establishment of peace which Jesus did, is that you must identify the conflict and it must be dealt with. Now, what I will tell you, and this is not always a pleasant thing to give consideration to, what I will tell you is, is that a, as a child of God, you remember we already have talked about the fact, and I kind of like set you up for this, we've already talked about the fact that peace has a price, Guess who pays the price for peace? As we look at the process of peace, 
forgiveness and grace is something that is foreign to this world as an operating principle. It's just not there. And understand that that is the gospel of grace that we, that we teach and preach. It is the message that we give. It is the reconciliation that we are supposed to bring and that we are supposed to be a part of. If we do not understand that process, then we can't help facilitate that. You know, it's an interesting thing. This world has an approach to peace. It has to do with negotiating and manipulating to get as much as we can out of the deal without the other person getting so dissatisfied that they walk away from the table. It is about leveraging our position and our desires to the extent that we can. And then, you know, as, as we have attained to a place where we got as much as we can, then we just learn to be satisfied with that. That's the type of peace this world offers. It's the type of peace that is uh, a misconception that sometimes we've adopted into our operating principles. But Scripture says there is a way which seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. And that really is the path of peace that this world lives under. And it is a way of death. It doesn't accomplish real peace, which only comes from the person of peace, who is Jesus Christ. You know, in Scripture, in Romans chapter 3, it says the path of peace they have not known, and there is no fear of God before their eyes. And this brings us back to the person of peace, that we can't have peace unless Christ reigns supreme in our heart. And unless we bring this operating principle to our conflict, then there will be no real peace for us. Unless we uh, show forth the attributes of Jesus Christ in grace and forgiveness, there will be no real peace because there's no willingness to pay a real price, only to compromise enough to get as much as I can and the other person the same. You see the difference between these two and the way that they operate. We know in Luke chapter 1, it says of Jesus, it says that he came to shine upon those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death. And he came to guide our way, our, our feet into the way of peace. There is a path for peace. And the path is not always a pleasant one. It's not an easy one. Uh, it means that many times we give up our rights. But isn't this the path that Jesus tr chose? Isn't this the example that he gave us? And, and it isn't a matter of becoming a doormat. And I hear that phrase many, many times. It is something that is exercised from a position of strength and knowledge and grace and understanding. And it says that when I exercise grace, it gives space for God to work. And that is not an easy path to walk. If you've ever been embroiled in conflict, you understand it you know that there is a price that must be paid. We also learn from this passage that peace has a people. It's something that was inherent in what Jesus did. It's real peace creates a people that are made for peace to make peace. This is, this is who you're called to be if you're a child of God. We don't always understand that this is the mantle that we have taken up. You know, as we examine our text, we find that it was His desire and his purpose that to he might reconcile them both in one body. And we have the symbol of this in the Jews and the Gentiles. The symbol of this body that Jesus was creating. This symbol of unity. This symbol of oneness. That you may be one as the Father and I are one. This was something that God wanted for his people. In fact, he was creating a people to live that out. The Jews had failed at that. In their, in their practice of religion, you see in Herod's temple an example of them uh, creating, creating disunity, uh, of making a wall in the very temple compound that kept out the world, the Gentiles, the rest of the, the, rest of the world that uh, you know, God had called them to be a house of prayer for all nations. And instead they created a hierarchy of spiritual you know, eliteness. And, you know, as God looked at it, he says it represents in its symbology the very thing that I didn't want to have. It, it doesn't show forth real peace. It doesn't show forth oneness. The provocation for it is, is not the correct thing. You know, God calls us as a people. He calls us peacemakers Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. It is your identity. 
And I tell you, we live in a world that's more ready to fight than to make peace. And you don't have to look around very far. People are spoiling for a fight right now. There's conflict and polarization everywhere. We even experience it in our own church. We see it in the way that people are enacting and living out in this pandemic. Some people like to wear masks. Some people don't like to wear masks. Some people want to go to church. Some people don't. I mean, and there's valid reasons for all of that. But understand that underlying all of the things, all of the things that God has instructed us in is to be a people of peace. And I don't care what your perspective is. God has called you to this. And you need to be very aware of it and practice it. He has called you to be a people of this. And I'm telling you that right now, there is a world that is watching how we handle ourselves. There is a world that is watching. I do not want them to not see this Prince of Peace that I love and serve because I haven't mastered the path of peace to become the people of peace. I don't want that. And it's only going to get worse. Now it's going to be, I don't think I should take the vaccine. I think I should. I don't want to be forced to take it. I'm going to be forced to take it. I mean, it, there will be no end of it. I can see the handwriting on the wall. In the end, I've got my own convictions. If you don't think I have an opinion, ask my wife. She'll tell you I've got, I've got more than one, actually, you know, usually. It's not that, and it's not that I want to invalidate our perspectives and opinions, but listen, those things are not as important as who we serve. And we have to remember that. This is not intended to be a rebuke and, you know, uh, an admonition for you to lay aside your brain. Have your thoughts. But be, be that peacemaker. Be that one that God has called to peace. That's what scripture teaches us. How do we pursue this peace? Well, you know, number one is don't be easily offended. Thicken your skin up just a little bit. Don't get offended at everything everybody says because people are frustrated. They're scared. They're hurting. And hurt people hurt people, right? So don't be easily offended and then do everything possible not to be offensive. Good grief, this is like basic Christian stuff, you know? If people are going to trip over something, I'd rather they did tripped over the stumbling block of Christ and not my stinking personality, right? I mean, these are the things that, they're just simple. Scripture teaches us giving no cause for offense in anything so that the ministry will not be discredited. This was Paul's operating approach. You don't think he was a person who had an opinion. You're, you're not reading your Bible. Uh, but you know what? He's like, listen, I do not want my opinions, my perspective, and my personality to get in the way of what I know God wants and who I love, you know, the Prince of Peace. Um, Ecclesiastes says, also do not take heart to everything people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. For many times also your own heart has known that even you have cursed others. I, I love that passage of Scripture. Like, don't be offended by, by what you hear people say. Uh, you know, if you're like me, and I don't really have a problem with this because uh, I've done it so many times, you've probably said stupid stuff, haven't you? All right? And, and you know, when somebody tells me, hey, Pastor, you, you know, you offended me, and I'm like, well, come on in, let's sit down and talk about it. It's not the first time I've probably said something stupid, you know? Um, let, me, let me apologize. And, you know, I'm not going to call a lie the truth or truth a lie, but I don't want to be offensive. And uh, I don't want to be easily offended either. If, scripture says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. So, see, sometimes we forget that. God says, you know, there are some people that are just seeking conflict. And it's just going to come. But as far as lies in you, as far as your ability, if it means you have to pay a price, then you need to seek peace. 
And this is just, I mean, it's just basic, well, it's just basic Christianity. And then the last thing we find out in our text is peace needs a preacher. And I want you to know that if you are like indwelt by God's spirit, then you are a preacher. All right. Now you may not be an ordained pastor, but you are a preacher. Why do I say that? Because you proclaim something. You proclaim it with your mouth. You proclaim it with your life. You are a preacher. And I don't know whether you realize this or not, but you're a natural preacher. And you'll preach about the things you're passionate about. Go ahead and look at your, you know, I don't know, look at your conversations that you've had in the past month. We, we are natural preachers. It's not just me, you know. It's all of us. We have things we're passionate about. We have things we speak to. And, you know, what we need to do is understand that that is something God-given that needs to be leveraged for God's work. Peace needs a preacher. Real peace not only creates a people of peace, it commissions them to speak peace. Sometimes we're just passionate about the wrong things. And, And it's not that we're passionate about wrong things. We're just passionate about the wrong things. What that means is we've gotten our priorities mixed up. We have forgotten what our primary calling is, and that is to preach the gospel. I am an emissary. Scripture teaches us that. In our text it says, He came, Jesus, and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. He preached to everyone. He says, For through Him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. And I don't understand it, It doesn't always make sense to me, but one of the things I understand in Scripture is that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Preaching is foolishness. Nobody wants to listen to that. Nobody wants to hear that Jesus died on the cross. Nobody wants to hear that they're a sinner and He paid for our sins. It's foolishness to a world who is dying. But for that one sinner who has, a, has this moment of realization, it becomes the power of God. It changes everything for them. This is what, as a people of God, we need to understand. That God has called us to preach with our mouth, with our life. And Scripture tells us, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I only pray to God that I will be as involved and as adept at performing my responsibilities in the ministry of reconciliation as I am at offending people. And I get it, people are ready to be offended many times. But Paul said, I do everything I can not to because I don't want to impact the sake of the ministry. I don't want them to not think well of Jesus. And this should consume us. Romans chapter 14, he says, So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. And this is an honorable pursuit. And I can tell you right now, that we are so polarized as a nation and as a people, and things are probably only going to continue in that vein because why would things be any different, right? At best, a cessation of hostilities is what we could expect. But we should preach so much more. You know, Scripture tells us, and I'll close with this, so then we pursue the things which make for peace, or excuse me, Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. (laughs) Isn't that like great? I'm a simple guy. I I like simple things. You were called to peace. That's my operating principle. That's what God says. And he says, and by the way, be thankful. Just be thankful. Isn't that, a, isn't that like a great thing to wrap your mind around and grab a hold of and implement for life? And as we go into this new year, 
you remember, if you want to take the peace of God with you, then you have to have the God of peace in you. Carry that with you as you interact with people and live that out in your life. I'm going to leave you with this for consideration. Brad will share with you a question. All right, so the last statement there is the consideration. Does your life and heart indicate that you are living out this call to peace from the Prince of Peace? That's what we got to consider here. Does our life and heart indicate that we are living out this call to peace from the Prince of Peace? And Bobby said peace on earth was not just a gift from God that he passed out like Christmas cookies but it comes through a person of Jesus Christ. For today in the city of David, there has been born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Peace has a price that must be paid, and peace comes as a result of desire for oneness and not of weariness of conflict. And peace creates people that are made for peace to make peace. And are we those people? And then peace has to have a preacher. And if we're those people, what do we preach? Do we preach the peace of Christ? And so that's what we end with in this is question is that our life and heart indicate that we are living out this call to peace from the Prince of Peace. And it, that's, that's good stuff. That was really good stuff. It was really um, thought-provoking. And hopefully you come away with something from that that says, am I that person of peace? Have I been made whole by God? and become a person of preach, and do I speak those words of peace to other people? And if you do not know Christ, and if you're at home watching us today and do not know Christ, we want to share this with you and teach you about this uh, relationship with Jesus Christ that brings peace in our life, only peace in our life that comes from that. So that's what we have today. Hey, as we dismiss today, we want to remind you that this coming Thursday night is our a Christmas Eve drive-in service. If you haven't already done so, please go online and RSVP for us and let us know if you're coming so we know how many cars to prepare for. We sure hope to see you guys there for that. Will you guys pray with me as we close today? Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and your peace. And God, we ask that you go with us now as we go out into this world, Lord, as we worship you in um, our lives. We love you, we thank you, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Guys, Merry Christmas and have a great week.